Hello and welcome to Hudson Institute. My name is Peter Rao. I'm a senior fellow here at Hudson and as of today, director of our brand new center on Europe and Eurasia. So it's a real thrill to welcome here to Hudson Institute to our new center, the Secretary General of the European Union's External Action Service, Stefano Sanino. Thank you so much for being here. He has a distinguished and illustrious career as a diplomat. Before becoming the Secretary General, he served as ambassador of his native Italy to Spain. He was appointed by, of course, the uh, High Representative and Vice President of the Commission, Josef Borrell, uh, to be Secretary General to follow the legendary Helga Schmidt, effective January 1st, 2021. And perhaps we'll just start right there. Uh, given your switch from uh, national government service to European service, we here in the United States oftentimes think of uh, national security and foreign policy as the domain of the nation state. Today, Charles Michel is uh, meeting with Xi Jinping in Beijing. He, of course, is a European official. President Macron, one can't miss it if you're here in Washington with the flags being festooned everywhere, uh, is at the White House meeting with the president. How does the EEAS fit into the firmament of European diplomacy? How should we think about your organization? First of all, thank you very much for um, hosting me today. Um, uh, the, the External Action Service is sort of a um, 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 strange beast, if I can call it like this, because we are um, between two institutions, so we are partly with the foot in the uh, uh, Commission and with the foot in the Council, so in, in the, what is the uh, uh, executive body and the legislative body. So we have a little bit the two souls. And somehow uh, um, we represent what could be a, a diplomatic service of a country. Uh, so the foreign policy dimension, I would say the foreign ministry dimension, plus a uh, um, defense dimension, because we have under the same roof also the, uh, um, uh, this, the, the military uh, staff, and a small uh, intelligence component. So uh, let's say the, I would say the security element in its broadest sense. And uh, um, uh, we represent the, uh, um, what we used to say, the diplomatic service of the European Union. Please. No, it's just the, uh, then, I mean, as you were saying, there is a dynamic between national and uh, uh, European. It does not mean that uh, uh, our national systems or national diplomacy do not exist anymore. But we try to uh, bring an element that uh, uh, takes into account the point of view of the 27 and try to create the synthesis uh, that we express then with the outside world. And the Secretary General's function within the EEAS? It's an interesting. Head honcho, is that <laughs> it's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting position uh, uh, because uh, uh, at the same time you are the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the, the first uh, advisor to the High Representative. Is uh, uh, you are. Also, I'm also in a way a sort of deputy, a deputizing in a number of uh, of things because he doesn't have official deputies. Um, and I'm the, uh, the person also that is uh, uh, ensuring the interinstitutional aspect. As I was saying before, we need to bring together 27 member states, um, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the foreign ministries of the 27, but also uh, the uh, um, commission and the different departments of the commission. So I'm working very much also on, on this. And finally, you have to manage the house. <laughs> So it's, um, it's a quite heavy job. Everything from special advisor to renovating the building all falls under your remit. Everything under the sun. <laughs> so those of you out there who follow um, your ambassador's Twitter channel here in Washington, which is a rather lively one, I commend it to all of you, will have noticed that you've already had a busy few days here. So it's been documented on, on Twitter. You had meetings with, I think I saw Senators Murphy and Shaheen on Capitol Hill. And the centerpiece of your visit, I believe, is uh, a series of talks with Wendy Sherman, our Deputy Secretary of State. What can you tell us about your trip here, why you're here, and uh, what you're hoping to address with our uh, both congressional and administration counterparts? Well, the heart of the, uh, uh, the mission uh, is a, a, our regular dialogue that we have with the United States on uh, China. So. Uh, uh, this is now the fourth edition of, uh, of this uh, dialogue. It's two years that we are having regular sessions every six months. And then uh, we have also a consultation on Indo-Pacific, so how we can, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, 
managed to get together in a, in a complex region like the Indo-Pacific, and it's also an opportunity to go through the uh, main files that uh, uh, we have on our agenda, and certainly the uh, um, Russian aggression against Ukraine is one of those. Um, but it is also an opportunity uh, uh, to uh, um, touch on the different, as the different components of the administration, from the uh, uh, Treasury for the sanctions to the uh, uh, defense for uh, um, our dialogue on security and defense, to the um, National Security Council, to the intelligence, uh, um, and to the uh, um, uh, to the Congress uh, and to the uh, Senate, because I, I've had contacts both with the uh, um, congressmen and, and senators on uh, both sides of the uh, political spectrum. Um, the legislature has a very important role, in, uh, in especially in the United States, in defining also the uh, uh, foreign policy. And hence, uh, I think that it's important for us to uh, reach out to them extensively and to explain uh, uh, what we are doing and what the, the U.N. and the U.S. can do together. Well, uh, Josep Borrell had a, had a quote in the South China Morning Post the other day that uh, Europe does not intend to follow China policy, at least was sort of the polemical headline one could say. Um, is that an unfair characterization? Are these tough talks? Are they happy talks? Um, how, how is the relationship between, between uh, Europe and, and the U.S. as we look to uh, China policy? I think that, uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be very honest, I think that it's a, a very, uh, uh, we are in a very good place. I think that uh, we have managed over time to develop a very thorough understanding of the reciprocal positions uh, um, and to uh, um, start working not only on uh, uh, the work of comparing notes, but to develop possibly uh, policies together. That was one of the... Uh, um, let's say the uh, uh, main conclusions of our discussion today that I think that we have now s a very solid basis that can allow us to go to a next dimension of our engagement. Um, the, it, for me, the problem is that we have to see this work not as a sort of uh, um, uh, way of confronting China, but on the way how to manage the relationship with China, the complexity of, uh, of this relationship. And to do so, I think that it's very important that we do with the United States um, and also with some um, with other like minded countries that uh, have an interest, uh, like we do, to have this relationship on, on a track which is constructive on one hand, but is also not naive and takes into account the challenges that are coming from the country. Well, let me press you a little bit on that point, because I think there is alignment between the US and Europe on strategic outlook. And for that, I'll just take you straight to the strategic outlook, of course, uh, released in March of 2019, Martin Selmayr's famous creation with Jean-Claude Juncker uh, presented to the world in which uh, the European Union defined its vision of China or its relationship with China as uh, one that's both a strategic rivalry and economic com competition, but also one that is a, a negotiating and cooperation partner. A lot of focus was put on the strategic rivalry, but I'd like to get to the partnership um, part really quickly. And, and for that, let me just lay one additional piece of context on top of that. Secretary Blinken at his confirmation hearings uh, now two years ago basically adopted the same language. I think he reversed the order, but he used the same tripartite sort of structure. And our national security strategy, which was just released here in the United States, also talked about geopolitical rivalry with China but then on transnational issues, from climate to public health, try to identify some areas where we have to cooperate with China. If that's a pretty fair summation, I think, of the NSS. But when I look at the American approach towards China over the past few years on those transnational issues, be they climate change or public health, we really haven't been able to make progress with the Chinese. No one accuses John Kerry of walking away from a negotiation or, or trying to avoid a compromise. And yet he's thrown up its hands on China policy. On public health, we've seen virtually no uh, cooperation um, from the Chinese with the WHO. Have you had a better experience since March 2019? Is it time to revisit cooperation, or do you think it's still important to hold fast to that three-part structure? Uh, essentially, uh, um, our leaders that have discussed at length uh, in the relations with China just um, one month ago um, uh, were clear in saying that they uh, they still see this tripartite approach as a, a, a very, uh, um, say, apt to define the complexity of the relationship. 
Um, I think that when it comes to a, a climate change, in spite of all the difficulties, we still need to continue working with China. There is a little that we can do. <laughs> That's a, it's a key actor from that, from a, that point of view. Um, that said, it was the same Borrell who was saying that in this moment of these three elements, uh, the element of, of um, um, uh, rivalry and uh, um, um, Competition. Competition, sorry, um, are, have become much more relevant compared with the past. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, uh, um, the, the uh, how to manage this competition um, is really the key point at this stage. Um, uh, I, you were rightly saying that when we speak about competition, this tripartite uh, approach, we were uh, thinking more about the economic aspect. But I think that the competition uh, is broader mm -hmm. than that. And we have uh, in a number of other areas, uh, China, which has become much more assertive in the way they approach uh, uh, know, their relation with third countries or the vision about human rights or the political system. And from that point of view, we have to be able to uh, 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 respond to, uh, to this challenge um, and being able to define policies that are allowing us to uh, not to lose ground when it comes to the, uh, uh, this competition. Um, and this is not, I don't want to sound uh, too negative, but I think that competition is uh, a sort also of recognition uh, that uh, you have on the other side someone that has the means and the instruments to, uh, uh, to develop its vision and to implement its vision, but we need to be able to, uh, uh, to, to do better and to prove that our system delivers better, that our mechanisms are more effective, and that the work we do with third countries has a, a better impact on, uh, on the world. So it's also to us to uh, uh, prove that um, uh, we deliver better for our societies. Perhaps one of the biggest flashpoints in at least American competition with China has been uh, the issue or the island or the country of Taiwan. Um, how do you see from Europe the Taiwan issue or question? Has it come up in your talks with the Americans? Um, I, I would just say anecdotally, in my experience in uh, dialogues that we host here with Europeans, whenever the question of how Europe would respond to potential aggression over Taiwan comes up, there's been a lot of differences of opinion, which suggests to me, and please contradict me if I'm wrong, that maybe the issue hasn't been fully baked in Brussels yet. Is that true or is that unfair? Mm -hmm. I think it is unfair, to be honest, eh? because the, uh, there has been a lot of discussion on uh, this that uh, we have done. Uh, say among the 27 and mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the United States, there is a lot of uh, um, um, uh, attention that is given to what can be a very disruptive element. We are uh, speaking uh, um, uh, if there is an instability uh, um, in, uh, in, in, the, in the South China Sea or around Taiwan, this may have a disruptive impact for uh, our economies, uh, uh, for the uh, freedom of, uh, of movements, um, and a disruption of the status quo in the region, which is one of the uh, uh, points that we have always maintained with, uh, with the Chinese. So I think that there is a lot of uh, uh, thinking that goes on, on this. I don't think that we need necessarily to uh, um, publicize each and every element of this reflection. But the, um, um, indeed, uh, it is a, a, a point which occupies uh, a lot of our attention um, and will continue to be so. You mentioned that you've also uh, had talks on the Indo-Pacific writ large. And uh, when we set up this, uh, this conversation and, and talking with your team, they were very eager to include Indo-Pacific in the description of the event. So tell us a little bit more on why that's important and what it really means. What are your sort of vantage points and, and interests in the Indo-Pacific writ large? I think that uh, um, over time, we have developed a very uh, um, um, solid policy in the Indo-Pacific. First of all, and you were mentioning the fact that President Macron is here in, uh, in Washington, um, we have also a presence of one, of mm -hmm. one of our member states in the Indo-Pacific, France. To, uh, um, uh, to that purpose. So it's a, uh, um, uh, but the Indo Pacific uh, um, represents 
uh, from many points of view, one of the big uh, uh, challenges that we have, but also the big opportunities that we have for the future. Over time, we have developed a number of lines of action in the region, uh, um, starting from the overall strategy from the Indo-Pacific. I think the European Union was one of the first to have uh, to develop a, uh, a strategy for the region. That, by the way, I think that there are a lot of resonance also in this strategy that has been developed by the, uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. um, we have a very strong partnership with Japan, which bro it's very broad and covers uh, um, um, let's say, from the uh, trade and the economic to digital to green. So it's a very um, uh, solid partnership. Um, we have a, a strategic partnership with the ASEAN countries and, and uh, with the, uh, the association. The association is also very much uh, based on uh, um, our own mechanisms. Uh, so there is a, a, a sort of parallelism between the way uh, they are developing and looking at us. Um, the uh, network, the free trade agreements uh, with Singapore, um, uh, hopefully soon uh, with New Zealand, uh, with Australia, um, the work that we have started to do uh, with India, uh, we have set up with India a uh, Trade and Technology Council, we have relaunched the uh, uh, negotiations for a free trade agreement. So I think that if you put all these elements together, you are defining quite a substantial uh, uh, strategy uh, uh, for the region that is putting Europe, I think, in an important position for working on the stability of the region itself. And to me, there is also one other element which I would like to stress, that the, uh, um, uh, the vision of the security has become so indivisible that is now it's difficult to think in terms of all, all European terms of transatlantic dimension or a Pacific dimension, because essentially all is strictly interlinked and has an impact, and all these scenarios have impact one on the other. And that's why I think that while we are developing many other um, strategies, we needed to uh, focus more on, uh, and a lot on uh, this point as well. Well, I think we as Americans are oftentimes guilty of that because we're an ocean-going peoples. We sit behind the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, and so our worldview is transatlantic or Indo-Pacific. Um, but sometimes it's better maybe to just invoke two strategists to go from Mahan to Mackinder and talk about Eurasia, where Europe is really one tip or one end of Eurasia, and of course, uh, Southeast Asia on the other end, and all of it is interlinked in a certain respect. So let's stay on Eurasia and maybe go halfway in between Europe and, and East Asia, and that is the Middle East, where uh, the European Union has had a very important role in the negotiations between the United States and Iran over trying to I don't want to say resurrect because Europe is still in the JCPOA, but um, uh, uh, I suppose revitalize or, or, or bring back like Lazarus from the dead an agreement that's been struggling. Is the JCPOA dead? Uh, what's the status of the agreement? If I say so, I will be killed. <laughs> I'm not going to. By whom? <laughs> by my boss. <laughs> no, I'm joking apart. I think that the, uh, we still have a very uh, uh, clear interest to uh, uh, avoid pr nuclear proliferation in the region. And I think that this is the, the bottom line of the work that we are uh, uh, trying to, uh, to do with, um, uh, with Iran uh, on, in the context of the JCPOA. Um, is it in a good health? I mean, I have my uh, uh, doubts, and uh, uh, certainly, uh, um, since the negotiations are um, um, uh, painfully uh, prolonging over many months and over years, I would say, um, uh, in the same at the same time, uh, um, you have a uh, the enrichment is going on, and uh, this is uh, an element which is, in in a way voiding of content, the negotiation. So there is a moment when, uh, and we will need to, uh, uh, to see uh, um, when this is going to come, uh, that the negotiations, uh, uh, if are not getting into a concrete result, may be uh, uh, pointless. We hope that we are, uh, we believe that we are not yet there. We believe that it's still uh, uh, time and the possibility to uh, get something out of this but it is true that the time is running out. I went back and looked, and I, I've heard that from at least American administration officials and some Europeans dating back over a year. So I wonder when that 
when that point will arrive. And I think that takes me to snapback. Um, some, uh, some Americans, and uh, we have an, a former Israeli national security official in-house here in our Center for Middle Eastern Peace and Security, has a stack this big of, of Iranian violations of the JCPOA. Europe is still in the deal. Do you think there's any uh, likelihood of going, going to snap back? And, and related to that, what is the plan B? Is there one uh, for the JCPOA? Um, I, I, uh, it's difficult at this moment to say which mm -hmm. is the plan B because we are still focusing on plan A and we do not want to uh, get into uh, another hypothesis for the time being. But it is true that the, uh, uh, the situation is getting more complex. The relationship with uh, uh, Iran are becoming more difficult. Uh, the negotiations, as you uh, were saying, and, and, and I was saying are not progressing. At the same time, you have the uh, wave of protests uh, uh, in the country, uh, uh, which are attracting a lot of attention, a lot of sympathy on, uh, on our side. And uh, you have the uh, uh, very ambiguous role that Iran is playing in the uh, um, war in Ukraine. Uh, the, the, the drones, the, the, uh, the military support they are giving to, uh, uh, to Russia, um, and the possible uh, destabilizing activities in, uh, in the Middle East. So I mean, from many points of view, the uh, relationship with Iran is becoming much more difficult, much more complex. Um, and uh, the, uh, the min foreign minister of the European Union will have a discussion uh, in the coming days um, on how to shape up the uh, next steps of this policy. Well, Iran is also active in, <clears throat> uh, I think, the conflict feeder that is most close, quite literally, but also figuratively to the heart of the Europeans. That, of course, is the, the Russian uh, attack on Ukraine. Iranian drones are essentially attacking the eastern flank uh, of NATO. Can you give us an overview, as you sit in Brussels, on how you see the war right now and, and, the, and the status of things? Well, I think that the, uh, um, is what we are all seeing. We have seen a very uh, aggressive stand of Russia with the uh, um, uh, conviction that they could uh, um, liquidate the, uh, Ukraine and uh, the, uh, the government, the Ukrainian government, in three days. And uh, um, after uh, uh, nine months, uh, they are stuck. They have lost a lot of ter territory that they had uh, conquered at the beginning. Um, and they, uh, uh, they have become, in the meantime, a sort of international pariah. And they are isolated. Uh, um, uh, with the um, heaviest uh, uh, sanctions imposed on them ever. So um, in a situation which is certainly uh, uh, not very uh, uh, reassuring for them. Um, they, we are now, uh, we see that both sides are uh, uh, consolidating uh, uh, their uh, front uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and their presence on the ground. Um, Everybody, all the military experts are telling that it's very likely that during the winter there will be a reduction of the level of operations. In the meantime, uh, uh, we have started uh, a, uh, an operation of uh, um, training for the troops of the, uh, um, of the Ukrainians. Would you uh, like to see the Americans involved in that? Absolutely. Believe in Poland, not yeah, yeah, it's the. I'd say I, I think that this is done uh, in uh, in perfect cooperations with the Americans and with the Brits. This is not. Um, it's not an operation. Let's say um, isolated from the overall uh, uh, support that we are giving mm -hmm. to Ukraine from the military point of view. Um, but let's say that what I wanted to say that we are trying to uh, use this time in order to uh, um, uh, train and to. Uh, uh, frame better the, uh, cap the military capacity of the, uh, of the Ukrainian uh, army. And uh, uh, it's done, uh, in, again, in very good cooperation with the, uh, with the United States, with the uh, uh, with UK. Um, uh, the Secretary of Defense, in one of the last meetings mm -hmm. of the Rammstein process, was praising and uh, uh, stressing the importance of this operation. So, I mean, we are very, from that point of view, I think that on, uh, on Ukraine, on the support we're giving to Ukraine, there is no light between us. We are really working very closely together. We have done it since the very beginning, from the imposition of sanctions to the uh, uh, military support, to the financial support, to the macrofinancial assistance, uh, uh, to the humanitarian assistance, and to the work that we also 
doing now in order to support the country to go through winter, sort of all the winterization uh, uh, programs. So, I mean, I do not see any kind of uh, uh, difference in the approach uh, uh, from that point of view. Well, we're certainly on the same side of the war, and that, I think, is the starting point for everything um, as, as allies and as the West collectively. I will say, though, that there has been some, um, perhaps grousing is putting it too, too strongly, but I think in Washington, um, at least among some senior Republicans, critique that I have heard that uh, the administration has not been uh, tin cupping at the levels that, say, James Baker did in the first Gulf War. And so when members of Congress and senators go back to their home districts and states, they're oftentimes questioned why the Americans are spending $20 billion on, say, just weapons deliveries alone with the latest $400 million drawdown and millions more in humanitarian aid and economic assistance. But the, some Europeans, at least, seem to be lagging a little bit be, behind. Would you, would you, uh, would you, um, uh, why well, already see you uh, shaking, so I'll just let you, um, I'll let you comment. No, I mean, I, I, I know because I have heard about this, and honestly, I do not, I don't want to go into this sort of, uh, uh, beauty contest about who is doing more or should do more. I think that we have done a lot on both sides. Um, we have been critical in different moments. At the beginning, uh, um, we have been uh, very supportive uh, militarily, the Europeans and uh, uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the Ukrainians. We are still doing that. I mean, um, um, uh, in the coming days, we are uh, 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 agreeing on replenishing the European Peace Facility, which is the instrument through yep. which we, the European Union, is supporting our member states for the, uh, their military assistance. Uh, we are uh, um, uh, pledging to, uh, not pledging, but disagreeing on two more billions for the European Peace Facility for 2023 and three more for 2024. So essentially, we have doubled the uh, size of the, uh, um, of the EPF. There is a work uh, undergoing on the 18 billion uh, of macrofinancial assistance to uh, to Ukraine, and I mean um, um, the, all the the, uh, the assistance that has gone. I, I don't know. I mean I, I think that if the figure is right, it's more than 48 billion. But on the top of that, to be honest, you need to uh, uh, include also what we have been doing to support the. 4.5 millions of refugees in Europe and uh, that are, let's say, being integrated into uh, our countries through the, to the uh, um, uh, scheme that is allowing them to have access to education, to health, to uh, uh, housing. And uh, I don't think that there is any kind of evaluation of how much is it. I don't know how much, for example, we have spent for the solidarity lanes uh, to uh, um, readjust our infrastructure in order to get grain uh, getting out of Ukraine and providing um, uh, money to Ukraine and uh, uh, support to third countries, or the uh, uh, work that we are doing on the uh, uh, trade facilitations. Uh, but again, I, I could go more on this. But I think that there is no point. I mean, we are together in this uh, uh, enterprise. We have, we all agree uh, that it is important to uh, uh, support Ukraine. We think that this has been one of the uh, most blatant violations of the uh, international order that we could uh, uh, have ever thought about. And uh, I don't think that from that point of view, there is any reason to uh, uh, blame or complain about what we are doing. I think we're doing very well together, and I hope that we'll continue to be doing uh, uh, it with the same kind of uh, commitment and engagement. And um, In fact, your, your European Parliament in a non-binding resolution just, uh, just hit the Russians for committing war crimes in Ukraine, which uh, earned the Parliament a bloody sledgehammer from you. Evgeny Prigozhin, as you, as you undoubtedly said, inscribed at the top on the hammer with PMC Wagner. So. Um, I, I think that was uh, almost a badge of honor, as we like to say, um, for um, uh, for the European Parliament. Um, is um, uh, what is the European uh, goal for Ukraine? I mean, what is the policy? Is it uh, uh, Ukraine must achieve victory in, in in liberating its territory? Is it that Ukraine should not be defeated? There is space between those two statements, I would argue. I mean, what is the uh, what is the what is the European position, if we can call it uh, that? 
The European position has been and will continue to be that it's up to the Ukrainians to decide what they want to achieve with this. I mean, uh, um, we, uh, uh, we have told since the very beginning that we will continue uh, uh, and we will support and will continue supporting Ukraine as long as necessary and as much as necessary. And we still stick to, uh, to this point. So the definition of the objective of this war are uh, the ones that uh, Ukraine is going to uh, uh, give to, in, to Ukrainian, for the, to the Ukrainian people, and uh, we will stick to this. When, um, when uh, we set up this conversation, your, your team with me, they insisted that you not only speak to me, but they wanted to involve the wider public. And so I put out queries for, um, for questions to ask you. And, uh, and I have to say, they might regret that I did that, because the number one request I got back and the number one article I got sent back to me is a, is a piece from Politico with the very harsh headline, Europe accuses US of profiting from war. But the specific quote that I'd like to, that I'd like to ask you about um, comes from one unnamed EU diplomat, so you can slap it away. But I think the sentiment you'll agree with um, is real. The quote is, the Inflation Reduction Act has changed everything. Is Washington still our ally or not? Can you touch on the bruised feelings? <laughs> I felt it on the television appearances I've done uh, in Europe over, the, over recent weeks over the Inflation Reduction Act. I, I don't know why my colleagues uh, asked you to ask. <laughs> 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 um, uh, look, I mean, we have been discussing this quite a lot, and this is, uh, uh, and I, I don't want to get too much into this because the, uh, um, I hope and I, I'm, I'm sure that at the end of the day we will manage to find a solution. Um, I think that what is important and what I would like to, uh, to stress here um, is that the, uh, um, uh, for the European Union what is important is not to uh, be discriminated uh, uh, yeah. when it comes to uh, measures that are being taken. Uh, this has been constantly our policy. Uh, uh, we have always said we are more than happy to uh, uh, have a sort of healthy competition. Um, uh, we are more than happy if the United States is willing to uh, uh, move uh, massively into uh, um, new uh, industrial policies. We are doing the same. I mean, when it comes to uh, uh, specifically the uh, um, uh, green technologies, but also when it comes to other uh, sectors like, I don't know, microchips. Uh, uh, we have been, and I think that I can say confidently, uh, we have never discriminated vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the American companies. We have always had a sort of uh, uh, openness, and if we were subsidizing or supporting certain sector, that was not only for the Europeans. So we hope that uh, uh, can be the same uh, for the United States. Uh, and that's, for me, it's the bottom line, but again, I will leave the negotiators doing their work and try to uh, iron out the uh, problems that we may face in this sector. Okay, but there will be negotiations is what you suggest because as one of my colleagues, Tom Dusterberg, has recommended, um, rather than a, a trade war arising out of this, it would be healthy for the Europeans to maybe work with some of our Asian Pacific allies like Japan and Korea, who are also none too pleased about the Inflation Reduction Act's protectionist components to see if in the implementation stage we might be able to work some of this out. The U.S. has neither the raw materials nor the manufacturing capacity for some of these measures that we're trying to encourage. And so um, do you think or sense that there might be flexibility on the American side to work through this? I, if there is one thing that I have to say I have appreciated enormously in these um, uh, years that I'm in, uh, in, in this position, uh, in the way in, in that I deal with the United States, is the fact that even when we have had the problem, we have, have always had the uh, willingness to uh, sit at the table and to find a solution. And I hope that this is going to be the case. Another uh, input I got when I asked for questions to ask the eminent secretary general was on how to coordinate uh, sort of grand strategy on some of these disbursements. Obviously, this is an, an example of trying to ensure that we're not engaging in a subsidy race, but instead um, you know, building out capacity. Um, when it comes to the developing world, you mentioned the um, relationship, the strategic importance that the EU attaches to ASEAN, but also, say, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, as the US and Europe look at development funding, market economics, building relationships in these places, perhaps 
uh, not explicitly saying that it is to counter Belt and Road or some of the Chinese initiative, but surely to offer an alternative. How do you think that coordination is going? How do you think that is unfolding between you and Wendy Sherman or your side and the American <laughs> side? Um, I think it's working pretty well. I mean, I'm, uh, um, uh, we have discussed quite at length also this morning uh, how to uh, um, work with third countries. Um, uh, this war has, um, let's say, has been uh, has changed many elements, but I would say also the paradigm of uh, uh, the relationship with them. Um, uh, with third countries. I was saying before that to me uh, uh, it's very difficult to now to separate the, uh, the different uh, uh, security theaters. Um, I was speaking mm. about uh, transatlantic and transpacific, but I would say also about north and south, about mm. uh, uh, emerge, uh, emerging, developed and developing. So I mean, uh, uh, from that point of view, there has been a, uh, uh, a for us, sort of need to look with a complete new, fresh eye at the way we uh, uh, develop our relationship with, uh, with third countries. And from uh, this perspective, the uh, uh, definition of uh, um, uh, our, if I can call this the way, offer to uh, this country has to be readjust. Um, the strategies, the uh, connectivity strategies, the um, one that we have developed, Global Gateways, is the one mm -hmm. on infrastructures that the uh, United States has developed, um, have a lot in common, an open, uh, value-based, uh, uh, that are not creating dependencies, that are uh, uh, meant to support the development of third countries, to create, let's say, better links. So, um, um, Qualitatively, they are very different from the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they have a different approach. They, they are based on a different vision. When we speak about competing visions uh, in, uh, in, uh, between us and China, um, and I think that from that point of view, uh, there are a lot of elements on which we are trying to work to see which are the complementarities on which we can work uh, in, uh, in, uh, in different countries, uh, um, and that. I mean, these complementarities can take different, let's say, shapes. Uh, that one work in a country and another one in another one. Feel or free to make a major announcement here. If you no, like. I mean, there is no, there are no major announcements. On the contrary, I mean, I'm, uh, I think that uh, uh, our work uh, uh, is a sort of very, uh, um, I wouldn't say obscure, but modest work. You have to uh, build walls brick yeah. by brick, essentially. And I mean, and they, so it's. Uh, you do we say the blocking day. and tackling for football though, <laughs> the process. Yeah, yeah. If you if you want to uh, call it this way, it's fine for me. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, and we are in a in a moment when speaking about football, it's very popular. That's right. <laughs> um, so it's the, it's not an announcement. It's just that we are trying to uh, 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 again to move from theory to practice. See concretely how we can share the work and how we can uh, make it sure that uh, uh, we are reaching uh, an, uh, to uh, uh, third countries in a constructive way to create a positive agenda with them, with, with them and to uh, 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 make it sure that uh, um, they can choose but knowing what they are choosing. Uh, I mean, we do not want to impose anything on third countries. I think that they are especially uh, 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 the African countries have uh, expressed very clearly uh, uh, the fact that they, 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 they want to retain their right to choose. Mm. But what we want to uh, give them is a, a real possibility of choosing and uh, uh, provide them with the, all the information that are needed to make the right choice. Well, the current system, which I would argue the United States and, and Europe to a certain extent built, is premised on giving countries the right to choose. That's why they still do have a choice. Whereas, at least as I read the Chinese vision, it's much more about vassalage and hierarchy. Those are my words, not yours. Um, and so uh, I would hope that that, that long-term interest supplants any short-term economic gain that might come along with some very attractive offers from the Chinese. Although even now, in the, in the short to medium term, we're seeing debt traps, among other things, come along yeah. with these. That said, we need to, uh, uh, to be able also to uh, 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 become more agile in the way we mm -hmm. deal with third countries, to deliver more rapidly, um, and to, uh, 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 to factor in the uh, time element which is not irrelevant for many of these right. countries. 
Um, in conclusion, I'll just take you back, since you mentioned the war uh, in, in that answer, and I think it's appropriate uh, talking with any European to, to end on what is right now the most important issue in transatlantic relations, the war. Uh, have you given any thought to what, in the mid to long term, Europe's relationship with Russia will look like? I've noted with um, the high representative, um, there is no tripartite structure with, tri with Russia right now. You said, under these circumstances, there's no opportunity for cooperation. Um, is that basically as far as we can see, or do you on the distant horizon have sketched out any vision of how Russian and European relations might unfold? I think that at this stage it's very difficult to have a sort of longer term perspective of uh, the relations with Russia, because the um, uh, variables uh, of the equation are so many that uh, it's uh, uh, almost impossible to uh, to think what is going to uh, to be and how what is going to happen in the coming years. Uh, and that's also the reason why, while we have tried to define uh, in, uh, in, in more uh, immediate terms the relationship with uh, uh, with Russia, we have uh, um, let's say we have not looked into the longer term uh, uh, dimension. Mm -hmm. That said, there are a number of elements that I I, I think that as an observer I can uh, I can see. Uh, one element is the uh, uh, the energy decoupling. Uh, Europe has decided to uh, uh, break its dependency on gas and oil from Russia. There's no going back. And uh, I mean, I don't know if in a very distant future Just there can be uh, uh, going back. But in the, in, for the moment, I mean, for the moment, for the immediate future, I do not see any kind of uh, uh, return to uh, uh, the previous situation. Um, uh, there are new uh, supply chains, so we are <clears throat> accelerating the transition. So in a way, I think that this a fact that is not going to change. Another element is that, uh, uh, and then again, uh, for the, I'm speaking for the uh, immediate future, let's say um, um, uh, companies, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the private sector uh, is not easy with the idea of being in Russia or investing in Russia. Uh, I see uh, uh, many more companies leaving rather than companies uh, uh, going to, uh, to Russia. And uh, once again, the uh, uh, investment decisions, uh, then once you have made them, it's difficult to change in the short term. I mean, Siemens has been in Russia since the 19th century, and they pulled up stakes and sacrificed hundreds of millions of dollars. But that's what I mean. Uh, uh, the, there is an element of, uh, I would say, of political choice, and then I mean, it's mm. difficult to uh, to go back. And there is uh, maybe the third element that I also uh, the uh, the rapprochement between uh, um, Russia and China, um, uh, which is I don't know if it's um, uh, long lasting. Uh, it's um, uh, it's a sort of. Uh, um, um, marriage for love or marriage for interest, uh, but certainly uh, I, I see that there is the, the, the links are starting to become much uh, much stronger. Uh, Russia will need much more China in uh, in the future to stay afloat economically, mm. um, and this is another element that I see uh, as a, uh, for the uh, for the coming years. So I mean I don't know if from this I can draw sort of final consequence, but there are some uh, elements which I think it's a part of um, uh, this reflection. I said that was the final question, but I'll have to ask one more based <laughs> on that last comment. How much is uh, China's support for Russia in the war and this relationship, which really goes back to the No Limits friendship codified at the Beijing Olympics, I think on February 4th of this year, shaping Brussels' attitudes towards Beijing? I think that it's, um, uh, it's a factor that uh, um, in Brussels we are taking into account. It's not, uh, it's not an irrelevant point. Um, we will keep on uh, uh, pushing uh, uh, China to, uh, to do more. Um, I have to admit that the, uh, uh, the declaration on the use of um, uh, nuclear weapons has been uh, um, important, and uh, we are I do not want to underestimate the importance of uh, uh, this. Um, but we would have expected uh, from a, uh, a global uh, power, a permanent member of the Security Council, maybe a little bit more boldness when it was coming to the uh, 
um, evaluation of the attitude of Russia against Ukraine. Well, Secretary General Sanino, thank you so much for honoring us, um, coming by Hudson Institute. I, um, I'm glad you've had a fruitful few days in Washington. I hope you haven't taken all of our negotiators to the cleaners, but have had a, a good talk <laughs> with Wendy Sherman. Thank you all at home for joining us um, for our inaugural event here at Hudson for our Center on Europe and Eurasia. Please join us tomorrow for a kickoff event with Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa, and please visit Hudson.org for all of our future programming. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.